now presents Inside Gene Shepherd. Things are moving apace here. A few uh, semesters ago, I uh, gave a, uh, a prediction that eventually it would become possible for a student to major in pornography in a major American university, and already that's come about. No, no, I mean officially major in pornography. A lot of have done it unofficially, but I mean officially, where you get a degree, you know, uh, and uh, the whole bit, you know. I don't know what the degree actually is, uh, what the specific letters are, you know, like M.A., Master of Arts, um, MSA maybe, Master of Slob Arts, I don't know. But uh, uh, I, I, I predicted this, and now I would like to salute uh, major new movements in American higher educational circles. Because you understand now uh, that ma uh, many universities are having trouble today financially, right? Well, one of the reasons is because a lot of guys ain't going to school. I mean, you uh, have a lot of, oh, yes, now they're out actively recruiting people. Used to be, you used to recruit a college. You know, You'd go there and you'd knock on your door. Oh, man, I'll tell you, I'm, many of the sad sights I've seen of, of lines of, of, of eager students, would-be penitents lined up before the uh, dean of administrations, you know, the dean of admissions. He's out there in front of that old Grecian palace where they admit students to the, uh, to the rarefied atmosphere of higher, higher uh, education, the academy, knocking on the door, knocking, oh, please let me in, please, please. Please, I had 107.9 average. I had, I had better than A average. They don't have no letters that go that high. I have an IQ of 264. They even stopped measuring that. Please, get out. We don't have time for you. Boom. And Gramercy's big iron door slammed shut and tight, right? Well, this is what was happening. But now it's the other way around. And, uh, of course, what's, what's one of the best ways to get the to get people to come to what you're doing. Broadway discovered, no, no, it's not money. See, you're, you think like an old man. Money has nothing to do with today's life, really. It's only older people that worry about money. And this is the truth. I mean it. It's a, money is an outmoded form of expression. And for those of you out there who think by getting money, you're proving something, you're only proving you're old. That's all. Uh, and I, that's right. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't make the news, friends. I only report it, and this happens to be the truth. And anybody who realizes how useless money is today, uh, who's ever tried to buy... Why, it's very common for a guy to walk into a suburban shopping center, and uh, he wants to put a switch in this house. You know, the switch is burned out in the living room. He goes in, and, and the guy says, uh, switch, switch? You want to buy a switch, or do you want to rent one? 
She says, well, I was thinking of buying one, you know, one of the little 49-cent switches with the little brown plastic knob that says off and on one of them things. He says, wait a minute, uh, Mr. Carruthers, here's a man here inquiring about switches. At which point, Mr. Carruthers comes out with a velvet case, the way they used to do it in Tiffany's. And he shows you their selection of, uh, of various uh, switches. You can get the presentation switch. You can get, you know, the switch that you give your wife. If you have such a creature living with you, you can give her this for their, your anniversary. You celebrate 20 years in the hovel there. Uh, you know, oh, yes, and all switches today begin at a dollar and a half and go up. Now, you didn't know that, did you? Yes, you did. Well, that means money is valueless. If, if, a, if a 12 cent plastic switch is selling for a dollar 49, money has no value. So anybody who's been spending his lifetime collecting money has been, he might as well have been collecting United Cigar Store coupons. It's about as, in fact, you could probably get more now for a nice mint condition set of United Cigar Store coupons. They haven't, you know, that's now a camp. Seriously. Oh, yes. You know that you can get more money today for your old bathtub? You've got this old rotten bathtub sitting in the, in the john there, you know, with the iron feet, with the claws on the bottom, and you've been trying to get rid of it for years, you know, and you sit in that thing. Well, that thing is now worth an almost, almost an un, uh, uh, the, the amount of money you can get from certain chic decorators I know down in the village staggers the imagination for a rotten old crummy iron bathtub, the kind that used to be piled up a mile high at the dumps all around the country, right? So, the money is useless. I know a guy that, uh, that came to me the other day, a friend of mine, he says, Shepard, he says, I really did it. And I said, what'd you do? He says, look what I got. And I says, what do you got? He says, well, he said, uh, sit down, because I know the shock is going to be pretty great, but I'm going to show you something, a fantastic buy I just made. I said, really, Bob, what'd you buy? He says, wait. And he takes out this briefcase, got a lock on it. First time I ever saw him lock his briefcase, he unlocks the briefcase, you know, very carefully. And he says, now, wait a minute. Now, don't, don't close the door. I don't want anybody to see this. You know, there's stick-up men everywhere now. Maybe a big high steer. And I said, what do you got? And I sat there waiting. You know, I expected him to, you know, come out with this string of uh, priceless pearls. You know, the native Polynesian divers have, have dived for and came up with the, with the oysters in their teeth, you know, the magnificent pearls. Or something like that, because his face was flushed with acquisition. I mean, he looked like the kind of guy that has just gotten himself, finally, a complete set of original Rembrandt etchings. And Rembrandt himself, you know, etched each one. And, and I said, well, gee, Bob, I, you find it? He said, yeah, I made it. He said, my God, I made it. He said, all my life I wanted this. And I finally did it. And I said, well, uh, how much did it cost you before you show it to me, Bob? So I know whether to be shocked. And he says, I know you're going to talk about money. When you talk about something truly valuable, you do not discuss money. I said, well, that's true, Bob, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> by George, that's quite true, come to think of it. If you're going to buy, uh, you know, if you're going to buy uh, an original Botticelli, I suppose money is kind of ridiculous when you're dealing with uh, stuff that has to do with the ages. He said, that's exactly right. And he opens up his briefcase, and he very carefully lifts out this this uh, big wad with looked like velvet wrapping. It was all wrapped up so it wouldn't break. You know, he just take it out very carefully. And he puts it on the desk and he unwrapped this thing like he was unwrapping perhaps uh, some really valuable object like uh, maybe the skull of Piltdown Man, of which only one has been found in Java. And he opens it up and I said, Well, Bob, you put me on. What, 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 what? I don't have time to mess around with you. I mean, you think I'm going to fall down on the floor because you got an Ovaltine shake-up mug with Orphan Annie's picture on the side with a decal? He said, you, I thought you of all people would understand, would appreciate. This has cost me a year and a half salary. It's a priceless objet d'art. I said, Bob, either the world has gone mad or else I've gone sane. Maybe that's my problem. I suddenly woke up one morning and I was sane. I don't know what it is, Bob. But then I realized that, you know, his, his, his eyes were welling up, these great tears. And I, I had to, you know, when, when somebody just lays some goody on you like that, you got to pretend. I said, oh, I'm just kidding you, Bob. <laughs> oh, God almighty. Bob, that's unbelievable. Oh, that's fantastic. It doesn't make any difference what you paid for it, Bob. It's worth every last miserable nothing cent of it. $700, $500, $1,000. Bob says you're getting close. 
you're still low. It's five hundred thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. It doesn't make any difference, one way or the other. It's important, Bob. You've done it. You've done it. You've done it. Yeah. Uh, 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 hooray, we're marching. We're marching as we're forward on our way to anarchy. God knows where it'll end. God knows where it'll go. But we are, are on our way. Oh, oh, oh. Eddie's, reset that, Corporal. Eddie's. And while we're sitting here mulling that one over, no, he actually did. He had a, he had a genuine Ovaltine shake-up mug, and God only knows what he paid for it. It just was staggering, and he was so proud of it. So I've I've had the vague sneaking suspicion. You, have you ever heard the expression "the invasion of the barbarians"? That's a, a good expression. Most people think barbarians are other people. Uh, you know, usually giants with beards, wearing these bearskin rugs, right? Carrying these great big clubs with uh, knots all over them, and wearing big collars with spikes sticking out of them, right? Spitting on the floor, right? Eating pigs whole. That's a, you know, a swilling down gigantic flagons of some unmentionable brew, you know, that smells like swamp water fermented with the essence of toad. Well, that's a, that's a true uh, barbarian. But I, I, I've, I've come to re reevaluate the phrase barbarian, and I suspect that we are the barbarians. We really are. I mean, any, uh, any barbarian will tell you that an orphan any Ovaltine shake-up mug is a lot prettier than anything Botticelli ever turned out, right? Well, of course, this is what Attila the Hun did. The minute he came in, he knocked down all the paintings, blew up all the statues, and uh, had a giant party. <laughs> Gave off favors. Everybody wore funny hats and danced on the tables, right? Well, that, uh, that's the orgiastic world of the... And if you can do it under the guise of bringing in civilization, oh, you got it coming and going. <laughs> George. <laughs> and so that leads us right to the point of tonight's show. We would like to salute the movement ever upward and onward towards the world of Attila the Hun by America's major institutions of higher learning. <laughs> Good evening, sport fans. Once again, it's time for news and views from the world of sports. And this is your sportcaster, Stan Lamox, bringing you news of the sports world. And today, the news and views in the world of sports celebrates one of the old line sporting institutions of America, Rutgers. We've all heard the expression, I want to die for dear old Rutgers. So tonight, as a public service, we salute Rutgers in our parade of major American universities. Good evening, sport fans. Tonight we're going to salute Rutgers because of an advertisement that appeared in one of our favorite university humor magazines, the Rutgers Targum, which is the university newspaper. An advertisement which was published last week reads this way. It begins with the headline, Sex and Alcohol. What effect does alcohol have on sexual arousal in the human male? Research being conducted by the Alcohol Behavior Research Laboratory and the Rutgers Medical School offers this opportunity. You can long last now, find a job, and work your way through school. View erotic films, have a couple of drinks, and get paid for your time. That's what the ad says. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding you. There's the ad right there. This is going into my vast file of truly significant trivia. So the years from now, years from now, when they want to know what life was like in America at the end of the 20th century, they'll know. Can't you just see the scene? You know, you know, some kid sitting in, say, you know, some kid sitting in his in his in his dormitory over here in Rutgers. You know, he's in this little this little concrete cubicle of his. See, and all of a sudden, somebody down the hall hollers, "Hey, Howie! There's a phone call for you, Howie!" And how he comes running out of, you know, he figures this chick is calling him or something, you know, and he comes running out and he runs down to the end of the hall and picks up the phone. He says, yeah, oh, Howie here. And at the other end is the old man. He says, Howie, 
Hey, Howie, listen, I want to tell you, I just got laid off down at the plant. And it's going to be rough sending you to school, kid. I just thought I'd let you know. Then I don't know whether I can raise the scratch for next year's tuition. It's really rough down here at the Grumman plant. And Howie, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, I, I paid last year's, but I don't know what I'm going to do at this time. Hey, Dad, don't worry. I got a job. It's okay, Dad. I'm going to work my way through school. I mean, you know, just like a self-made man like John Wayne, all the rest of you guys, I'm, I've at last got a job. And it's all cool, Dad. Oh, really? This is the first job you ever had, Howie. What are you going to do? I mean, I can't imagine you liking, you know? I mean, I, you know, a guy with a sensitive mind like you got and all that, and, and uh, gee whiz, you know, all them friends of yours, I can't see you liking. Well, it's all right, Dad. I'll tell you what I'm doing. Uh, I've got this job. Uh, I just answered an ad here at the Targum. You know, that's the university paper. Uh, you're surprised, right, that, that I've learned to read since I came to school. But uh, they have methods here to teach us, you know. They have these little ducks and stuff with the Ds under them and all. I learned all right. And uh, I just read this ad in a, in a paper here today, and uh, me and my friend Clarence are going down. We got the jobs all sewed up, and I uh, got this guy, Stanley. We all going down there, and we're going to work every Wednesday and Friday afternoon. Got a job. We're going to earn some dough, and it's all set down. And not only that, I'm contributing to the forward of uh, human knowledge. I'm, uh, you know what I'm doing. See, I, you know that. The, the reason I never liked is because I never found nothing that I could do for human beings. I mean, the problem with that, of course, you realize, that my generation does not just work. We've got to have something that contributes to the general welfare of humankind. And you know what humankind is, Dad, don't you? Well, yeah, you mean all these, these guys walking around down here at the shopping center at Staten Island and all that? Yes, Dad, that's, that's the crowd. And uh, we want to help that crowd as much as we can because we are a part of the dedicated generation. And uh, as part of the dedicated generation, we don't just take a job like you did at the Grumman plant and build on all those airplanes where you, you go and shoot people and all that stuff. No way. We, in our generation, we must have work that is not only personally satisfying, that one can, that one can become involved with, but also that contributes to the general welfare of mankind. Well, gee, Holly, I'm glad to see you got a job. You're going to work over at the hospital or something, carrying bedpans, something like that around? You know, like, uh, gee, what was his name? The kid down the other end of the street, uh, you know, the one that they finally picked up on a drug charge? Uh, of course, it was totally, uh, totally uh, unjustified. I admit that. But after all, when a guy's only got two or three pounds of cocaine in his back pocket and he's just taking it for his friends, I can understand that that's not really peddling. But uh, now, actually, what kind of a job you got, Holly? Come on, lay it on the old man. I, I want to tell Emily, you know, that you got a job. Hey, Emily, Emily, Howie's got a job. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. He's going to tell me what he's doing. Well, it's something good, you know. It's helping mankind. Yeah. I'm mean, contributing to the general welfare. Uh, did you say contributing to general welfare, Howie? Is that what it is to uh, mankind? Yeah, that's right, Dad. Yes, he's contributing to the general welfare of mankind. He's helping people so that they know more about themselves and life will be better, you know? You know how he's a good boy, right? Tell me now, Howie, what is the job? Well, Dad, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know how quite to approach this, but Dad, you remember them days when you used to go down to the, down to the, uh, well, uh, let's come right out and say, you know, I'm also part of the truthful generation. We just laid on the line about other generations, especially, you know. And uh, what I'm going to say is, Dad, you know how your generation you used to go down to the American Legion Hall on Wednesday nights, 2 o'clock in the morning, and watch them films, right? You used to call them smokers. Do you remember them, Dad? Oh, yeah, oh, that was the days. I, I, I'll never forget. You remember the time that we all got busted that time? And the cops came down here from Babylon? <laughs> and they arrested a whole bunch of us down at the Legion Hall, thrown us in? I'll never forget the film that they were showing at night, Howie. Oh, it was fantastic. It was called The Orgy Up in Lil's Room. <laughs> hey, yeah, and they, put, they even got the command in on that one, you know. Yes, that's right, Dad. You remember those days? Now, your generation went to see them films just because they were dirty films. And also, what happened before and after the films? Oh, come on, Howie. You know that we used to tie them on every Wednesday night. I'd go out and get a, you know, get a snoot full of gin and beer and booze and all that stuff. I don't do that no more. Why are you bringing all that up anyway? Yes, that's the point, Dad. You used to go down and, you know, you'd, you'd knock down the four or five uh, half pints of gin, and then you'd go in and drink some beer, and you'd smoke all those cigars, and then you'd go up and watch dirty pictures. And why was that? That was because you came out of the generation of lascivious people. Sex was an unnatural thing to you people. And sex was not only unnatural to you people, but sex also was an object. You made sexual objects of people. 
You went and watched those films, and those people were degrading themselves, watching them, being in those films. And you went there, and you aided and abetted that. That was a rotten generation you was in, Dad. You know that, and you admit it now. Well, come on, Howie. What's a guy going to do, you know? I mean, you get caught in these things, and after all, it was only Wednesday night, and we were raising dough. After all, we did send seven kids to scout camp at the money we raised at them smokers. After all, we did that, right? Dad, you want to know about my job? Yeah, Howie, what is it? Hey, Mabel! Hey, hey, Emily, Emily, listen, call Mabel up. Mabel, you know, Mabel's back home again from the reform school. Hey, Mabel! Mabel, listen, Emily and Mabel, Howie's got a job. He's going to tell me what it is now. Okay, lay it on me, Howie. Well, Dad, I am contributing to mankind because it was an ad in the Targum paper here that said that you could aid medical research. Now, you know medical research is very important, Dad. After all, medical research, you know how they filled your teeth last month there? All that stuff, that's very important. They couldn't have done that without medical research. And medical research is good stuff, right, Dad? Well, uh, yeah, I suppose so, but I like them chiropractors. You know, I'll tell you this. You know how my back was aching me all them years? Well, I went to this chiropractor, Dr. Quackenbush, and he really fixed me. And I, you know, they, the doctors, they are made rotten. They all keep putting them down. But I'm telling you, Dad, now wait a minute. I don't want to get off on a chiropractor. I am now working my way through college, Dad, viewing erotic films. I view erotic films, me and Stanley, and uh, we got a couple of other guys. Marty's going down there, too. And we get paid every Wednesday and Friday for viewing erotic films. And we also... Uh, we also intake what we call ingest. We ingest certain specified amounts of alcohol. Now, in my case, my alcohol is made in the form of what uh, the other generation used to call martinis. We call this a specified allotted ingestion quotient dosage of alcohol. Now, that's 2.7 ounces with 1.3 milligrams of something called vermouth. I don't know what that is. It's some kind of a medical term. They put vermouth in it. And they put a thing in there they call a twist. I guess this uh, lemon in there does something to it. I don't know what it is. It's a catalyst, actually. Now, what I do is I ingest a certain number of those, seven, eight, nine, depending on how many they wish to measure at the time, and I view erotic films. And this way, I earn $7 an hour, and it's okay, you're off the hook, Dad. I think I can make the tuition for next year. $7 an hour. And I've asked for additional time because I want to give more to mankind, you know, and I, I figure if I can do that every day after school, I mean, watch erotic, and, and uh, actually, we don't really watch them. What we do is observe them. I observe an erotic film. Hey, Owie, what is an erotic film? You mean a film like uh, Fellini and all them uh, Italians make, all them Italians? No, Dad, no, 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 no. Actually, last Wednesday, we actually observed the orgy up in Lil's room, this very same film that you got busted for. Now, you see, our generation, Dad, has learned how to watch dirty films and get, get bombed out of their head at the same time while getting paid for it, and they're going to have it as a credit. Uh, actually, it's going to be a three-credit program next year. See, our generation is much more advanced than yours. You, 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 just, you just people didn't realize what you were doing. It's too bad, Dad. Gee, you know, I, 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 I just, just I, I misjudged you, Howie. I must say, your generation is much more creative than ours. I'll tell you that. We used to just run around and get bombed. What you people do is very important. I realize that. What you do is measure the effect of alcohol on the libido of the human male. Is that correct? Ah, very good. And you also observe erotic films. Did you get all that, Emily? He observes erotic films, and he is measuring the effect of alcohol on the human male's erotic impulses. Yes, he's contributing a hell of a lot, yeah. What do you mean you don't understand it? Well, you know what happens when that clod down the street comes home on a Saturday night after he's watched all them pornies down on 42nd Street and he's bombed out of his skull, all that fist fighting and the cops come, right? Well, Howie is measuring how come that happens. Okay, yeah. All right, good boy, Howie. Yeah, we're all proud of you, Howie. You just stick with it, boy. And uh, I'll be calling you next week at the same time. I'll be calling you. I'll And so, sport fans, this is Stan Lamox once again saying good evening, sport fans, after tonight's salute to a major 
Educational University on the Eastern Seaboard. Rutgers marches on. I kind of like that, you know. <laughs> uh, do you ever have the sneaking suspicion you went to school about ten years too soon? Yes, indeed. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, but that, that whole thing about that uh, viewing the erotic films, I can see those guys all sitting around, you know. <laughs> I'm using the phrase, of course, of an outmoded generation, and I'm doing that purposely. You better understand, I know what, exactly what I'm doing. That is called tongue-in-cheek satire, friend, and if you don't know what tongue-in-cheek satire is, it ain't exactly the National Lampoon, right? Of which I've written many pieces for. However, uh, uh, seriously, though, uh, <laughs> it's all nomenclature. Mankind remains the same. It, rema it never changes. The guy that went to see those films at the smoker at the American Legion and bought all those martinis, he thought he was doing something for mankind, too. You know, they were sending seven kids to the camp. You just don't go watch these films. You, you have to do something positive. You know, it's, it's a, you, you, uh, you know, many of them would come home from the Legion and say, oh, you know, those films are a drag, but, you know, I want to send them kids to camp. I'll tell you. And, uh, yeah, you know, I, I just hate to drink that much. Uh, you know, just, but uh, what, what are you going to do? You know, Clarence got all that booze in. I figured, what the heck, you know, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> yeah, and I just, so, uh, uh in the end, uh, <laughs> man remains the same. He, he that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the, uh, is the amount of pomposity he applies to what he does. So if you want to hold up a bank today, you don't just go in and pull a heist. You are making a protest against a capitalistic society. Is what you're really doing. You understand that. And when you are interviewed by Gabe Pressman and Mike Wallace, you make that point very clear. This is not a heist. Uh, have you noticed that all the uh, around the world uh, various types of uh, kidnappers? They no, they don't just they don't just kidnap a guy and ask for a million bucks. No, they're fighting against an imperialistic society. What they do with the million bananas, uh, nobody says anything about. But of course, there's many a <laughs> many a retired kidnapper now living in luxury to the style to which he had loved to have been accustomed years ago on the various islands of the South Pacific. He's still carrying on the good work, though. You know, he goes out once in a while, pulls a job, and uh, makes another strike for freedom. So you, you, can't, you can't just uh, do anything just because you want to do it. You have to have a good moral and philosophical reason for it. It's very important. I mean, uh, you know what, what, uh, uh, I, you know, what, made, uh, what made John Dillinger such a, such a uh, refreshing sight on the scene, and why he's still part of the American folklore legend, is that he let it all hang out. One time when he was interviewed at the Lake County Jail, uh, after, after uh, you know, going all over the country and knocking over banks, about 400, maybe 500 a month, uh, he was interviewed. And uh, they said to John Dillinger, did you know what he said? They said to Dillinger, this interviewer from the Chicago Tribune, said, uh, Mr. Dillinger, uh, all due respect, why are you doing this? And Dillinger, after a long pregnant pause, looking at the guy like he was totally out of his bird, says, what do you mean, why am I doing it? He says, but Mr. Dillinger, uh, you are in a life of, uh, of total depravity and crime, and you're running around robbing all these banks. Why are you doing this? Is it because you come from a, a benighted childhood? Is it because your early sexual impulses were thwarted? He said, are you kidding? He said, I like the dough. He said, where else can you make $42,000 in maybe 15, 20 seconds? Well, me and Red and Babyface, we not we got over two hundred thousand dollars last week alone. Took us maybe fifteen twenty minutes total. Not only that, we stole a car we did it in, so we didn't even have no overhead. Right? We actually knocked over two sporting goods stores. Actually, stole the Tommy guns. So what the hell? I mean, you know, it's good money. Spend a couple of days in jail, and you break bust out again. And uh, I can see this is a is a nice career for a young man. Actually, well, they were outraged. The entire Midwest was outraged at such candor. You just don't say things like that. What you have to do is form an organization called a, 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 a strike force for people's freedom. What you call it, see? <laughs> and then you go out and you start knocking over banks. <laughs> and, uh, of course, at that point, not only will William Kunstler come to your aid and defense, uh, free, usually, uh, but more than that, you'll become a folk hero and quite possibly be on the cover of almost 15 or 20 underground magazines within 10 minutes, giving out interviews at a thousand bucks a clip, you retire to Algiers and you got the world, buddy. You know what? No problem at all to it, right? Right. So, so nothing really changes. Everybody wants the same thing. They always have. 
I mean, from the very beginning. Now, I, I know this from, for a fact. I, I, I was involved one time, and this is now confession time. Okay, it's confession time. And the following story will prove to be distasteful to many of you. And, I, and as I say, you cannot fabricate life. It's, it's just there, you know. It just lays there like a clam on the bottom of the river there. You can't fabricate it. It's doing it. So uh, I'm sitting in, uh, this is, you know, university-type school, and I'm in school. I'm in university and I'm uh, one of my, you know, yeah. When you go when you go to any kind of an institution of uh, learning, there are long periods of of uh, you, you get into a a mood of total, you know, blue funk. You figure, what the hell is this Punic War stuff? I mean, what am I doing here? I mean, I've had 17 semesters of Jane Austen. What the hell is this? I'm so damn tired of of uh, Northanger Abbey. I'm going to throw up the next time I hear the word Jane Austen. And you're sitting there, and I'm I'm. And one day I'm sitting in my my dormitory room, and, and this guy next door to me named Herbert, there's a guy named Herbie, in the next room there, and, and Herbie was a humanities major, and uh, he he's in the in the in the room there whistling and singing, and uh, and he's bugging me. See, I, I, there's nothing that you hate to hear around you is somebody in good spirits when you're feeling rotten. You agree? So I'm sitting in there and I'm looking at that damn Jane Austen. And uh, I had this this Jane Austen workbook. Can you imagine a workbook? Uh, you know, workbook. That's a good description of it. I'm sitting in there, looking at the blue workbook. It's this Jane Austen irony workbook. You know, I was doing lab tests in irony, and um, I mean, does irony react uh, negatively or positively when in a sulfide solution? Uh, does it turn red or yellow or pink, or do you throw up? Which is it? You know, you have four choices. So uh, I'm sitting there in a the class. Or rather, in this this uh, crummy <laughs> dormitory room, and I hear Herbert whistling. So, so I said, "Shut up! Will you knock off the whistling? I'm sitting here brooding." And he comes strolling into the room, and he says, "What is the trouble?" I said, "Herbert, what is the trouble? Look at this. I'm six weeks behind in this rotten Jane Austen. I'm seven weeks behind in organic chemistry. I'm four thousand weeks behind in life, and I'm sitting here. My life is going out, oozing out of me like out of a." tube of toothpaste and what am I getting for it? Credits. Credits. They don't put credits on a guy's headstone. What do you get for it? He said, oh, well, you're just doing the wrong things, friend. <laughs> Sitting there reading about the Punic Wars. I came to my senses here last semester. I said, what do you mean? He said, I am majoring in psychology. I said, you are? Gee, that sounds like fun. What do you do? He said, well, many things. In fact, would you care to... Uh, Come with me tonight. We're having a laboratory session, and uh, I can get you in. I said, really? What? You know, any port in a storm. I was so damn bored. You know, I was going down and watching people just eat hamburgers at the White Castle. That's all I could do, you know. That's the kind of night it was. So the two of us went out into the rain, and we walked across campus, and we're in this little room now. And there's a lot of males sitting around in here. And it's a room with glass. I was introduced to the professor who took my name down and said, uh, if uh, if uh, Herbert uh, vouches for you, I think we'd like to have you as one of our one of our subjects. Anytime you call a guy a subject, he can do anything. So we sat in this room with glass around us. It was two way mirrors, and they turned the lights down and they put electrodes on my ears. And everybody had electrodes. We're all sitting talking very serious. And then the lights went on in the next room, beyond the the glass, where you could see them in there, and they couldn't see you. You know those two-way, one-way mirrors? And we see this girl come in. We're all sitting there watching. I said, what do I do, Herbert? He says, nothing, just watch. He says, the machines do the rest. I mean, they're recording everything. And a girl came in, and she got undressed. Completely. I was fantastic. And, of course, all of us sophomores were sitting there digging the scene. See, so she comes in. It's a fantastic strip show. She gets undressed, you know, the whole bit right down to, you know, right down, man. Right down to where it was. And I said, hey, this is fantastic. How long has this been going on, Herbie? He says, shut up. You're not supposed to enjoy it. Now keep your mouth shut and just sit and watch. Let the machines do all the recording. Don't you say anything. I said, oh, okay. And so that girl left and another one comes in. This went on for about an hour and a half. And after it was all over, they turned the lights on. It was a hell of an evening. They turned the lights on, and the professor got up and says, A very interesting evening. Uh, we'll collate and correlate all the findings, 
and uh, you gentlemen will all be here in room 202 again next Wednesday at this same time. Thank you very much for your time, and we appreciate your aid and help in our research project. I said, Herbie, I said, Herbie, do you realize the world is full of guys that are paying for shows like that? He says, look, he says, look, you slob, will you shut up? We were doing serious psychological research. We were measuring the various bodily changes that comes about in a growing uh, pubescent male when he is uh, presented with erotic impulses. Now, you keep that in mind, and if anybody asks you what you were doing Wednesday in room 202, you tell them that. Don't sit around and say you were watching all these chicks. But it was kind of great, wasn't it? I said, oh, it was fantastic. Oh, oh, oh. He says, okay, let's go down to the chock full of nuts and get ourselves a cup of coffee. And, you know, two weeks later, I'm in the library, and one of those girls came in, sat down. She was a sociology major. I said, hey, I was in room 202 last week. She says, it's fun, isn't it? I said, yes, it is, sir. <laughs> What'd you say your name was? But, uh, things changed drastically in my second year in university. I began to learn what the story was, and uh, I've never since uh, turned back. Just give your, give, your, give your act, whatever it is, a good, nice, preferably Latin-sounding title, friend, and you can do almost anything in this world. <laughs> well, uh, that shepherd is such a slob, you know, he really doesn't understand. You know, he's such a bad person. Oh, wow. This guy's really out of the dark ages. What a rotten way to talk. Oh, ugh. <laughs> yes, indeed. My impression of Rutgers went up five, six, seven hundred percent. I'd love to go there. Take some postgraduate stuff over there. You ought to see what they do in the PG course. It's unbelievable. Man, goats and gorillas. It's fantastic. Yes, sir. By recording from New York, you've been listening to Inside Gene Shepherd. Be sure to join us Friday evening at 7 o'clock for our next Shepherd program. Right now, it's 22 minutes before 8 o'clock. Our temperature is 56 degrees. And in tonight's news, the United Mine Workers Bargaining Council has called for some minor adjustments in the proposed coal industry contract before it is submitted to the union members for ratification.